Hey guys, welcome back to another whiteboard chat. And today we're going to talk about overreaching and overtraining. So I, I want to talk about some, some of the practical things that might be useful in terms of knowing when you might be overreaching, overtraining, kind of what it, what the two terms mean, um, maybe the difference between the two terms, some good takeaways in terms of how you can correct it and avoid it perhaps. Um, so we'll go over some of that stuff, but first I think it's important to break down, you know, what, what it is exactly. So the two terms are somewhat interchangeable, but one's just more extreme than the other. And you know, when you break it down to a really uh, simple base, we're talking about overreaching being an acute, you know, uh, basically an acute form of overtraining, overtraining being chronic, right? And that's, and that's more or less what I'm talking about. So we have, if we look at recovery ability, I broke this down into a couple different types of, of charts here. We basically, this is, you know, this is essentially what we're looking at. I tried, I attempted to draw this little tear totter of stress and recovery capacity and trying to balance the two. Stress being stressors in general, right? Any kind of stressor, whether that's, you know, training, um, work, life, sleep, you know, sleep imbalance, uh, emotional, whatever. Because, you know, as, as people that train often and train hard, we tend to have a lot of the normal stuff that a lot of people will have, right? And a lot of things people have to worry about on a regular basis. And then we are also adding an additional large stressor into that multiple times per week, right? So, you know, our, our recovery ability is going to be going to be tapped out by the end of the week, right? So how does this happen? Well, I drew a couple different little charts here to kind of break it down, but Let's look at it, look at it in this kind of, this like a, the upside down U, I guess, in that we have the stress resistance, stress inhibition load. We have fitness, you know, whatever, whatever kind of fitness it is. We have a, we have a spot here where we are, we're in, you know, we're in optimal zone, right? We have the right amount of resistance. We have the right amount of recovery. We have the right, you know, right stress or right amount of recovery. We're not over here and overtrained. We're not clear over here in, or I'm sorry, in overreached, and we're not clear over here in the overtraining zone. We want to be somewhere, you know, we want to be somewhere up there. Now, could we intentionally, this might be a topic for, topic for more so training programming, but there are instances where people will intentionally program overreaching phases, right? Where they'll, they may know that something's coming up where they'll have to rest afterwards. Maybe they have an event. Maybe they have a time in their life where they're going to have downtime and they won't be able to train as hard or put as much time into it. Maybe they have an, an injury or a surgery or it could be a number of things. So they may intentionally overreach, right? Uh, because acutely, you know, in that acute overreaching sense, you're not necessarily going to do damage. Your body can bounce back from that. Whereas when you get further into the overtrained state, that's when it takes longer to recover, and that's when you potentially might start doing damage to um, other systems that manage stress, right? Okay, so that's, I mean, that's more or less the breakdown of it. And then I wanted to point out, too, on this line, you'll see here a couple different zones. Now, if we're not doing enough, there'll be no adaption. No adaption being you're under-trained, you're not, you're not giving enough of a stressor to form an adaption to grow muscle, right? That's your goal. And then we have optimal. The optimal is up here somewhere. We have overreached. Again, that's acute. We have overtrained, which is chronic. So we, we want to hang out probably somewhere from maybe here to here. If we creep over here a little bit, that's okay. If we go maybe a little behind that, that might be okay as well. Just kind of depends. But somewhere in that zone, that's where we're going to be able to uh, sustain not only recovery, but continue to get results. If we creep too far over here, that's when things like backing off, lowering intensity, deloading, all of that stuff, extra rest days, whatever it is, to pull us back into this zone. 
and that's and we're good to go right now one thing that's important to point out is that this the space between these different um, different sections is going to be different for different people not only is it going to be different for different people but it's also going to be different for how advanced the person is a beginner is going to be able to have a lot more area over here because they need a lot less to form an adaption. They can do less and get more out of less. Now, an advanced person is going to have a smaller gap between here and here, right? So if we do this, advanced. small gap. Now why is that? Why is an advanced going to have a smaller gap? Well, an advanced person is going to have a smaller gap because they need more. They potentially need more to adapt, whether they need more weight, they need more volume, they need more of something, right? To cause that adaption over time to continue to grow beyond whatever their set point is. So if they need more, then what else do they need more of? Well, <laughs> they're tapping into more of their recovery capacity. So again, this teeter totter is becoming unbalanced because they're needing to push more, whether it be weight or volume or you know whatever metric it is or variable. So that gap gets smaller, so they can more easily become overreached potentially, right? <laughs> and then on the flip side, they can more easily cause no adaption, also because they're just not doing enough, or not training hard enough, or not progressing in load or, wh or whatever. Right, so they need more. That's when that recovery. That's when you know. I mean, things like sleep and stress management and all that. I mean, it's important for anyone, but it's going to be more important the harder you push yourself, right? So that's it's going to be even more important for that person. That's when you can kind of look at this resources pie chart I made. Now I didn't fill in any sections. I just kind of drew lines in it because what I want to illustrate there is that. This exactly is that you have this, you have this uh, certain amount of resources that go into recovery. So maybe if this is what cuts, what's cutting into your recovery the most, right? Maybe if this is um, you have, let's say, a lot of stress at work. Maybe that's work stress. Your sleep's pretty good. So you don't have lack of sleep, so that's not really cutting into recovery. Maybe that's there. Maybe you have your relationship's good. It's not really causing much issue. Maybe that's there. Training, maybe that's there. And then that's, you know, just miscellaneous stressors. Right? So, you know, that says, that kind of shows what, what I'm talking about is that now our chart's all the way filled in. We are utilizing all of our recovery capacity. It's full. We don't have any more. We start disrupting that balance, and we're going to start tipping this teeter-totter over to this side. The scales will start tipping, right? So that's how I like to look at. That's how I like to look at recovery and look at overreaching and balance and recovery and training balance and all that. Is that I try to tell you know try to get it through to people that training is only part of the equation and that all of these outside stressors often add up to a larger amount of um, stress than anything else like I said you know put work over here well that's the largest part of the chart and that's not even training so if we're cutting into training is only taking up this small amount so if you're cutting into your recovery ability that much with all of these other things and your training only has that small amount uh, you're either going to have to do a couple things. I mean, you're going to have to be better at managing stress outside of the gym, environmental stressors, and or manipulate your training to where it's not too much. So are you still doing enough to cause an adaption now that you're training, that you're not training as much? That's where things get tricky and skewed because yes, you do need to cause an adaption, but yes, you do need to be able to be able to recover. So if you are doing enough to cause the adaption, but all, but that's 
too much of the pie chart and all this other stuff's out, now you're overstressed so that even though you did enough to cause that adaption, you're probably not gonna recover enough to grow anyhow. I hope, I hope that kind of makes sense. So it is a very fine balance for some people. And the more advanced people, it's gonna be even more of a fine balance or just people that tend to not have as good a recovery ability for whatever reason, there could be a number of reasons. So men and women might be different, people, different genetics, you know, might be predisposed to differences. I mean, there's a lot of things that could go into that, but we have to find that balance, all right? So some other things that are happening. We go over here to stressors. So acute stressors, chronic stressors, we have releasing hormone, we have stress, we have releasing hormone, we, it's releasing our cortisol. Um, if you remember on the inflammatory, if you saw the whiteboard chat on inflammation, releasing these different cytokines and um, immuno type markers and proteins and all that stuff that I had mentioned on that uh, other video, we're kind of looking at that cascade and we're gonna recover. So we have cortisol, flat, flat, we train, you know, or we have a, a stressor. We're, we're talking about training mainly here since it's overreaching. We have, we train, boom, up, down. We have this amount of inflammation, or boom, up, down. We're good, we're recovered. Now, what can happen if this, this isn't an exact perfect illustration because there's potentially more than one thing that can happen, but if you're chronically stressed to the point where you can't even adapt anymore, you may see a couple things. You may see this elevate, inflammation elevate, and then they both stay elevated more than they should and they take a lot longer to come down and they potentially just don't come down at all because you're doing your next session and it's just overlapping. Or you have someone that has basically depleted their adrenal resources that are kind of in that adrenal insufficient state like I talked about on that whiteboard chat check that one out and now we're looking at this cortisol doesn't even go up like we're not even getting we're hardly even getting a cortisol response we might be still getting an inflammation response that's way too big and lasts way too long but we're not even really getting a cortisol response and this is all out of balance right uh, and they're not going to recover and they're not going to have they're not going to feel good enough to train hard enough to get an adaption. And if they do, their recovery is just gonna to continue to get worse. So this is a spot where you're in a chronically overtrained state and you have to back off and you have to recover. And you may potentially have to take steps back. Uh, there are instances where people will take steps forward, get so chronically overtrained at a point and have to take more steps back than they took forward. I mean, does that happen? Yes. Obviously, the intent is to catch it well before that happens. Nothing wrong with being a little overreached and having to uh, having to correct that. That's fine. I mean, it happens to everyone. You can't predict everything. And, and even in this chart, like I said, if things get skewed a little bit, even if our training is staying the same the whole time and one of these things got out of whack that wasn't expected, we can't always predict that stuff. We might be a little overreached. We might have to correct it in whatever way that's appropriate based on that situation. But... Obviously, our intent is to never get to this state, or at least try not to get to this state, because it's just going to take a long time uh, to, to get out of it, and we might actually lose results. So, Now, cues. What are things that you can look for? Well, well-being, mood. Uh, if, if you're getting into a, a really overtrained state, or even just a, an overreached state, you might see differences in mood just because of disruption in adrenal hormones and catecholamines and things like this um, that, that make you feel good, right? Potentially, okay. Sleep, uh, well, sleep and adrenal patterns, I kind of put those in there because if if you've ever seen how cortisol, is, cortisol is pulsatile in the sense that it does have a certain waves throughout the day. It's normally gonna be higher in the morning. It should be a little bit lower, or should be lower before bed because you wanna be able to go to sleep. But of course it releases at different points during the day when it needs to be released because of the stress. Now, however, some people will get their patterns all wacky. Like it, you know, if I've, I've looked at a, a four point adrenal test, so I'm using like a Dutch test, which I talked about, and I see that 
they're low in the morning, but they're high at night and they can't sleep. Well, yeah, they can't sleep because their cortisol is high at night or they're having a, mid, a middle of the night spike and they wake up and their their heart is racing or they can't go back to sleep in the morning or they wake up at two, you know, four in the morning and they can't go back to sleep or whatever. They notice their heart rate's elevated or whatever it is. I mean, there's a disruption in those adrenal hormones and in that circadian rhythm as a whole. And a lot of that's just a result of stress because the person's overreached. And then when they get into a chronically overtrained state, it can just potentially get worse. Now that's, you know, those, so those are cues to look for when I, people are, when I see in an update or something that somebody's sleep is off and their mood is off and all these things are starting to become off and I haven't changed anything in the training and, I'm going to look at other variables, right? So it's kind of what I'm alluding to there. Digestion, we know that, well, we know that digestion is a parasympathetic process. So obviously if we're sympathetically driven, then we might have a digest, some digestive uh, issues. Again, if I haven't changed anything in the plan and the, someone all of a sudden starts having digestive issues, I might start looking at outside factors because, well, why did that happen? Well, I mean, that's stress, a stressor or being overreached uh, can be one of the very first things that uh, causes those issues. I, a very, very short term example. <laughs> I've had, so I've experimented with different, you know, carbohydrate powders, right? Different things that, that agree with my stomach in larger amounts. So I've got that dialed in. I pretty much know what that is. This is a, this might be kind of a gross example, but I'm going to give you, you'll, you'll get it. <laughs> it's, it might be graphic, but having tr training sessions that are so hard that you have such a, such an extreme acute stressor and CNS drive and par or sympathetic drive from those sessions that you just have diarrhea after the session's over. You have loose stools, right? Had that before <laughs> more than once, but, and I know that I'm like, okay, what is that from? Well, I know what it's from. And then it goes away and it's like as soon as I, you know, recover, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, I've, I've experienced that. So I'm not saying that's good. That's not. I don't really necessarily want that to happen, but it can. And go down performance. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if performance is going down, then you have a problem. I mean, outside of situations where extreme low calories or something like that, is it? A decline in performance necessarily related to you being overreached or overtrained. I mean, it, it could be, could be a number of things. I mean, it could be, could be something hormonal. I mean, it could be a lot of things, but obviously this is something that could potentially decline because of being overreached. So, so there's, there's a pretty good overview of everything. Uh, I know I went into a lot more than just being overreached or overtrained, but I wanted you to be able to know what actually goes into that happening, why it happens, these zones that I talked about, recovery resources, this cascade, um, different cues, right? The takeaway messages, you know, because everyone says, well, how do you fix it? Well, you got to figure out what's causing it. Look at your pie chart. Think about your pie chart. What has changed in your pie chart? What's, what is changing in your cues? Figure out what the culprit is. Have you ramped up your training a bunch? Maybe, maybe not. Have you had different stressors in your life? Maybe, maybe not. Hey, maybe you do have extra stressors in your life, but you can't fix them. Okay. Well, now how do I correct my pie chart? Well, you might have to back off trading temporarily. That might be the only way to balance out the pie chart, even though it might not be the best way to cause the adaption, still might be the only way that you can recover at least temporarily until you're able to correct the other things going on in life. So sometimes you may have to program around life and not life around program. So it happens. Uh, but yeah, that's a great overview for, I hope it's a great overview for you guys. And, uh, Talk to you next time.